Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Tabard Inn, new American cuisine in one of Washington, D.C.'s oldest hotels, located in DuPont Circle. For more information, visit tabardinn.com. Bienvenidos, uh, mi gente. Uh, well, we're really excited today on Cooking in Mexican from A to Z. We have a wonderful guest, my hermano, somebody that I admire and respect very much. And we're going to be talking about a, a, a subject matter that is near and dear to a lot of people. And we're going to breach the subject of tequila, right? Mexico's national spirit. Uh, we're really excited, uh, alongside my mom, Sara Martinez, of course, to invite Manny Nojosa. Manny is the global ambassador for Tequila Cazadores, uh, which is under the umbrella of, of Bacardi. Um, and Manny and I are dear, dear friends. He's my compadre. He's someone that I care a lot about. And in the last 10 years, we have become very close. So to have him here to talk about tequila is an absolute treat for us. So bienvenido, Manny. Thank you for being part of the podcast. Gracias, brother. Gracias. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure, Sarela. Uh, the, thank you for the invite. I think it took a little bit too long, Aaron, to um, to finally you after ten years you can trust me and invite me to the show. <laughs> he, he he's he's the, been he's been telling me Manny has to come. Manny has to come. Yeah. But you know we we're, we were dealing a lot with Oaxaca at that time. We were, we were dealing a lot with, with mezcal. So mm-hmm. what is the main difference between mezcal and tequila? Two different spirits. At the end of the day, we're talking about now they they all have their own classification. But back in the day, they were all los mezcales de Mexico. You know, yeah. they're all, they were all, they were in one category, mezcales. Yeah. Uh, tequila, tequila. Uh, we can argue, we can sit down and talk for hours about who is king, who is better, who was first, who was, la- you know, all that. Uh, tequila, five states of Mexico, produced with only 100% blue agave tequila. Uh, most of the production of tequila comes from the state of Jalisco. Uh, about 95% of the production is all Jalisco. Uh, mezcal, the production process is different. Uh, the agave is different agave. They do. They don't use just one type of agave. They cook the agaves underground with rocks and wood, and they're smoky. So they're all beautiful agave spirits. Los espíritus de México, las bebidas espirituosas de México. They all deserve a beautiful respect, but it's what makes Mexico or Mexico be. On the top of the, everybody wants a taste of Mexico. Everybody wants a taste of tequila. Everybody wants a taste of mezcal, bacanora, sotol, pulque. Everybody in this point, I think, is the best time we ever have in so many years. And I think thanks to to you, Sarela, and thanks to you, Aaron, and so many people, and the history that we have in the country, that Mexico or Mexico is in the best position ever. Everybody wants to be Mexican. Everybody wants to Mexico. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there was a time when my restaurant was very young. 
that it, we were the largest consumer of tequila in the entire state. A purchaser, mom. Purchaser. Purchaser. Yeah, yeah. Well, you bought more tequila than anybody in New York State. Yeah. So, Manny, can you talk to us a little bit to all of our listeners about how you got started into the business? Because I know that your, your your dad was a diplomat in Mexico. You have roots. Uh, obviously, you're, you're from Mexico City, which we're not going to fault you for. But we can make fun of you. Um, and then, but you have root, you have roots in Veracruz, uh, a través de tu jefe, to tu papá. So talk to us a little bit about your story. Okay, so born, I was born in Mexico City. Mom, Spanish, dad from Veracruz, Mexico. Uh, grew up in Mexico City. My dad was a lawyer. He was in the politics. And he wanted me to be like him. And he really, I love my dad and I love everything. He was my, he's still my hero. He's no longer around. But uh, he, I went to law school because he was a lawyer. I wanted to kind of follow his uh, footsteps. And I started working in the, I mean, I started working in the House of Representatives in Mexico City, the Federal uh, Congress. And I did it for like three years and it was not my thing. After I really got, to there and it's like no I don't really wanna do that so I moved to Cancun I moved to Cancun and I start working club and I start having a good time <laughs> finally I you know really good time uh, and, I, I'm, and, I'm, and, you're, and, I'm, and you're still here and I'm talking I'm, I'm talking I'm talking 85 86 yeah. so a long time ago Cancun was just maybe I know 10 years old, you know, Cancun was nothing. So it was just a few hotels, a few clubs, and the downtown was just developing, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I moved to Cancun. I did my part over there. One day I say, I got to go. I have to move on. Went back to Mexico City and finished a few things I have to do. I did, and I moved to San Francisco. And law degree, uh, everything I have didn't count. And it's like... My my thing was let's go back to law and it's like no ten more years of school, not really. So I start working at a restaurant and I start bussing tables. You know the English was not the best; it's still not the best. But uh, but uh, but I start bussing tables and from there I move on to bar back and from there to 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 bar manager and uh, I did my part in a Mexican restaurant for about eight years. From there I moved to a very chefy restaurant in the East Bay of San Francisco. And that's when one day a liquor company came to me. It's like, hey, Manny, you want to compete in a, this cocktail competition? And I said, i never been in any cocktail competition. So I went there and I got second place and I got my $500, you know, prize and I'm, my little name on the paper. And I was very happy with that. And from there, I start people, they start liquor companies started coming to me. Manny, you want to compete there? And in one point, when I look around, I was just winning a lot of competitions, and I was not doing too much local. I was doing international. And after winning uh, the Bar and Nightclub show in Vegas, uh, Bacardi uh, came to me and invited me to represent Tequila Casadores. And the rest, and the rest is history. Yeah, but mom, you went to you went to college in Guadalajara, right? I went yes. Uh huh. So talk to me a little bit about what your earliest uh, exposure to tequila was at that time when you were there. Well, it was, it was very interesting because my parents would not let me stay in near our, our Prieto Sonora in, because I was having a great time because the hippies were coming. <laughs> so they sent me off to finishing school in Guadalajara, Instituto de Formación Familiar, and I said to my dad, forget this. I'm not going to do this. So I went into the school. Uh, the uh, mass communications, and and there there was a girl named Judy Smilgus Sousa. Mm. So so it was there was one of the, the Sousa girls. Her mother was American. Family. Yeah. So so I went to to the factory and everything. Mm. And that was your that was your earliest sort of introduction to tequila, mom. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Because it, and, and in the north, talk to us a little bit about the agave spirits, right? In in the north of Mexico. It's more vacanora, sotol, obviously, right? But they're not made with agave. Is sotol not made with agave, Manny? They're made with different type of. I mean, they're all they're all they call in the north they call it cactus. Mm -hmm. But uh, at, a 
at the end of the day, they're different type of agaves that they mm. use for mm -hmm. the for the production. I, I, I don't I don't know about that, but what were you told, mom? What were you told? No, I mean, if you just look it up on, on Wikipedia, wherever, it's a particular botanical plant. It's it's not like a, it's not like an agave, but it might be another type of cactus. You're right. It's, it's not in the in the in the lily family like the blue agave. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. And normally they grow in the wild, so you know it's not like yeah. you know it's not like the tequila production that you have. All those beautiful fields, and every mm. year, I mean, every seven years, six years, people they're harvesting. No, people over here to the production of, of bacanora and soto, they have to go to the desert and and get this 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 cactus or, or this type of ag or, or the agave on the agar family that, that has been growing there for years, and they get mm. a lot of juice out of that, and they yeah. make soto and bacanora. So let's talk a little bit about Manny because everyone uh, un assumes that tequila is made all over Mexico. And, and we, we apologize for uh, putting this in layman terms, but you mentioned five states. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, the idea where you can technically produce tequila um, um, and they're put into municipalities. Right. So we're talking a little bit about Jalisco, which is the king, Guanajuato, Michoacán, Nayarit and Tamaulipas. Right. But Manny, I want you to share with us the difference between why Jalisco is the king and why you have regions like the, 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 the Valle and then you have Los Altos. And what is the difference and why is that important? So let's start, see, I don't, uh, so let's start with the country. We had 32 states in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Out of those 32 states, only five, the ones you mentioned, mm -hmm. they can produce tequila by law. Mm -hmm. Right? Because agave, blue agave, grows in different parts of the country. But they can, even if they make the liquid, they cannot call it tequila. Mm -hmm. Okay? So everything in the history of, 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 of the tequila is started right there in the state of Jalisco. Gotcha. And is there, is there a history of who started it? Well, I can tell you who, was, who were the first ones to start producing and commercializing tequila. So that was that was La Rojeña, Fabrica La Rojeña, Jose Cuervo, and after that, Zenobio Sousa start producing. And after that, another little ones, and after that, another big, 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 big player, Herradura. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. uh, but everything started in the town of Tequila. Uh -huh. And uh, for many years, they don't even call it Tequila. They call it Vino de Mezcal. Mm -hmm. And from there, they start, you know... It, Using the, they were using any agave. It, even in Mexico, we don't use the word agave. We use the word maguey or mezcales mm -hmm. when you're referring to the plant. And they were using all kinds of different agaves or, or magueyes or mezcales to make this liquid. Finally, they start just using blue agave tequilana Weber mm. to use tequila. Because that was very, is what mostly grow in that region in the town of Tequila. So that's mm. why they call it, the, the, the liquid called Tequila, a name of the town where, you know, everything in the history, you know, happened in that town. So Los Altos, right, where Tequila Cazadores is produced and then you had the Valle, a lot of people say there's a different flavor profile. Some people say that. The tequilas from the Valle are where most all the big boys play there, right? Yeah. Uh, all the big, uh, and it's very herbaceous and almost has like, it seems hot when you taste it. It's like a weird flavor profile. When you go to Los Altos, it seems a lot more smoother, a lot more uh, softer and sweeter in flavor. Why do you think that is, man? So first, let's go to the state of Jalisco. The whole state of Jalisco can produce tequila. Mm -hmm. Guanajuato, uh, Tamaulipas, all those some certain areas. After Jalisco is Michoacán, the one that has more municipalities, they mm -hmm. can produce. Now, in the state of Jalisco, as you mentioned, Aaron, we have two main regions producers of tequila. So you have El Valle, the Valley, or Los Altos de Jalisco. Everything in the history started in the, va in the Valley. So you had the big boys there. Uh, they produce me, I'm a tequilero, you are a tequilero, we love tequila, we love the history. 
we never talk bad about no brands, nothing. You know, everybody deserves, you know, their credit for everything. But tequilas in, in the valley, they have different flavor profile because the soils are different, the rainfall is different, the weather is different, altitude is different. Tequilas from Los Altos, they're going to give you different flavor profiles, a lot of iron, uh, the, a little hotter, uh, less water, you know, the agaves, they grow bigger. So one mm. is you're going to get more juice from the agave because you have a bigger agave. Mm. Uh, the tequilas from Los Altos, they're going to be sweeter, more floral, more citrusy. Tequilas from the valley, they're going to be more herbal, more earthy. Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty of tequila, wherever, where the, where the plant, with this magic mm -hmm. plant that needs to grow for about six, seven, eight years. And after that, when they harvest, the plant die and you have to move to another field. All depends with this plant, where this plant grows uh, is what is going to reflect on the flavor of the tequila. I was just going to make a comment about the Altos de Jalisco. When I was in the university there, we used to go there. Y tenían unos ponches. Mm -hmm. Did you ever mm -hmm. have them? They're like the fruit liqueurs. Yeah, mm. no, they, lo they love to make. I mean, Los Altos de Jalisco is, is famous for a lot of stuff. It's, it's, famous, like for, it's famous for the tequila production. It's, it's famous for all those beautiful uh, uh, canteritos. In the Cantarito. The, the, because it's famous for dairy. It's a lot of ranches and a lot of uh, pig farms. Uh -huh. So the carnitas, I think after the Uruapan, Michoacán, the carnitas and arandas, they're, you know, they're beautiful. Uh, another thing makes uh, uh, arandas or, or Los Altos famous is, is the, the, the women. They're some of the most beautiful uh, women in, in the... No, in, it's true. It's true because... It's true. The, and, the, and the men too, the, the, because they're very tall and very thin yeah, and, yeah. and very and light, light skin and a lot of green eyes. Yeah, yeah. they don't... They, they, it's not the typical Mexican. You mm -hmm. know, the people, you know, the, how we, you and me are on and we look, you know, they're tall, blue eyes. You know, uh, but they, there is, is in that region, a lot of Italians, a lot of French, a lot of Germans settled centuries, years ago. Mm. And, uh, and that's why the dairy is so, imp so famous and the dairies and, and the cows and all that kind is famous over there because they moved from Italy and from France. From from Germany yeah. and it's what they used to do, you know. Or the north of Spain. I mean, everybody in the north of Spain was very light. My mom, you know, was light, very light skin, very light skin. Yeah, no, but Manny, you were going to say something earlier when we were talking a little bit about Los Altos versus the Valle. Please, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have two different flavor profiles, and that's mm. what makes tequila beautiful, right? How you know where the te where the tequila where the agave grows as it's kind of reflecting to the liquid. Mm -hmm. what, what, what makes something like Dragones so expensive, let's say? Yeah, and talk a little bit about some of those little tricks that some people do. You don't have to name brands, but as far as coloring agents and caramels and all the marketing and, and caca that's around some of the tequila <laughs> brands, okay? Please, uh, without naming anybody, but just say some of so, the stuff. There are two different styles of tequila, right? So you have a tequila, tequila, category tequila, and you have a tequila 100%. So it's very important for everybody to know what is the difference when you buy a tequila that you don't have the 100% on the label, right? Mm -hmm. A tequila, people know it as a mixed tequila, uh, but the, the category is just tequila. Uh, that tequila has to be minimum of 50, 51% sugars from blue agave tequila and however, and the rest can be sugars from different sources. Tequila, 100% or 100% is all the sugars that come from blue agave tequila and however. Tequila mixto, that tequila, Mexico or Mexico sell the liquid bulk and they can send it to China or they can send it to Kentucky or they can send it anywhere around the world. And they add the rest of the blend to make a cheaper uh, liquid. And it's going to have on the label tequila and you have a cheesy name yeah. right there, right? Uh, and, and, and they can be bottled anywhere around the world. So the Tequila Regulatory Council, the, the, the CRT, doesn't have control of what's going on with that liquid. 
That's why I always tell people, drink 100% blue agave tequilas. Dos tequilas, they make 100% from blue agave tequilana Weber. And those tequilas, they, they have to be by law bottled at the distillery where they were made. Mm. And everything is controlled by the Mexican government. Tequila is one of the most regular spirits in the world. Well, you know that the, the, the Japan had to go to world court because they brought out a synthetic tequila. And, mm. and Mexico sued them. And they won. We, yeah, we, so we won. Uh, South Africa, uh, California is trying to make one. Uh, I, I think Australia, they're trying to make one right now. Remember, the blue agave grows not just in Mexico, grows all over the world. The history say the, the, the Spanish came to Mexico and then their travels back and forth from, from the New Americas or the New Spain to the Europe, to Asia, they were using the agaves that they found in the Americas, and they were using it as a buoys. 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 So those, they got to land, and they start growing, they start reproducing. That's how agave, you can find agave all over the place. Wow. This episode is brought to you by Tabard Inn. Tabard Inn, Washington, D.C.'s quintessential hotel, is located on a quiet, tree-lined street just five blocks from the White House. Vibrant yet unassuming, the Tabard is comprised of 35 sleeping rooms, each unique in character and design. Feast on an eclectic American cuisine in their acclaimed restaurant, or enjoy a cocktail served on the beautiful patio, which has ample room for social distancing. Travelers from around the world find the Tabard the only place to stay when taking their travels to Washington. For more information, visit tabardin.com. So what is your, your favorite cocktails with tequila? Oh, no. And, and let's talk a little bit while we're on the subject, because this is a point of contention and we have a lot. We take the, the piss out of each other in the, Nos echamos mucha carrilla con esto, pero este, uh, where's the birthplace of the margarita, which is the, the, the most iconic cocktail utilizing tequila, obviously, right? And if, if you put five minutes of, uh, of attention to Tio Mario, he'll tell you that it was invented at the Cucamonga in Juarez. Okay, I need to... All speak. right, so let's stop. Uh, step, in, step in, step in. Parate. Parate, parate, para, para. <laughs> we, have a, we have a mutual friend from Argentina, and he, when we're in the middle of a conversation, we say, para, 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 para. para. Which so is so rude. It's, it's, like, it's so rude. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the, when we're talking about the margarita, the number one cocktail in the world after the Cuba Libre. Wow, you know? really? Wow. Yeah, Cuba Libre, number uno. Margarita, number two, but it's climbing and pretty soon it's going to be, you know, right there. Everybody wants to drink margaritas. Uh, everybody talks where, where it comes from, where it's from, you know. So I think, uh, you know, when I'm talking to Aaron, and Aaron is very proud Mexican, but it's very proud Mexican from El Norte. He's from, from Juarez, El Paso, and when he gets... Close, you know, with Tio Mario, they're they, they, they're they're not they're not nice to me, you know. <laughs> yeah, they always talk really bad, you know. So I don't really want to say what they say, but it's like so they think everything the the whole world what happened around Juarez. But guess <laughs> guess guess what, Aaron? I'm from La Capital, bro. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so the, yeah, I think so. I think the margarita was made in well, uh, in, in 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 Acapulco. That's really? A good, uh, that story that. that and tell me there. the story behind it. Tell me the story. Supposed to be, it was this lady from Texas, Margaret, mm. and she used to vacation in the golden era of Acapulco, where all the Hollywood stars and all the rich people, rich and famous, they used to go. Um, remember, Acapulco was the first resort, the the first international resort in the in the in the continent mm -hmm. you know uh second world war you know there was not too much travel so acapulco became kind of like a world center and what's not to like acapulco 
is beautiful. The base, the water, the, the, everything is very cool, Acapulco. So this lady from Texas traveled to Mexico, to, to Acapulco, super rich lady. But she was, I mean, tequila was there, but she wanted a cocktail. So this gentleman, bartender in Mexico, made this cocktail and called it Margaret from her, uh, Margarita, the name Margaret, and I make it. And the Margarita that he make back in that time is totally different from the Margaritas that we drink to this day. So it was tequila blanco, Controy, mm -hmm. the orange liqueur, the Mexican orange liqueur, a dash of dry, dry vermouth and fresh lime juice, shaky, shaky, syrup up, and no salt, nothing, up, and in a small glass, kind of like a martini, to do mm. three sips, you drink it, and that was it. Well, you know, it's like a, that, yeah. the style of a martini. And mom, talk to us a little bit about, you invested heavily in your restaurant, your namesake restaurant, Sarelas, in 1987. It was a game changer for everybody in the culinary world to understand Mexican food. But you had a frozen margarita machine that yeah. became as part of your identity at uh, the restaurant as your food. Now, talk to us a little I bit know. about the idea of the frozen margarita and why that was so part of it. Well, because I, I decided that I wanted to do them with fruits. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, used to, we bought the very expensive fruit purees, the French ones, mm -hmm. you know, with the mango and the, and the passion fruit and all the... We made our own strawberry mix, mm -hmm. but they used to call it drop uh, the margaritas drop your panties because it was like mm. people were the, the bar was like packed all the time and you never knew what people were doing on the floor on the <laughs> you know i mean it was like crazy so many people met there and because of margaritas they fell and a lot of them got married because of that. <laughs> and mom and then we used to have a rule at my mom's restaurant manny where if you had uh, you have one, and then you had another one, they had to watch you because they were very really? strong and stiff. The 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 uh, frozen margaritas, and it was something that was so special to the bar at Salerlas. You know, you come in there yeah, and yeah, yeah. and when, and Manny, with your uh, experience of tending bar as long as you have, um, what was your first introduction to the frozen margaritas and? Did you like do them in a blender? Did you have a machine? What was it? Y breve. So, y no vienes con un pinche discurso así muy largo, cabrón. Okay, let, hello, let's try to give, give, No, give me some time because I can, I can extend it, bro. So, I know, know I know. I can... Let's try to condense, cabrón. Okay, we okay, love it. Okay, so, so uh, I think the first frozen margarita I try is when I start working in Garcia's Mexican restaurant from Scottsdale, Cali Scottsdale Arizona. I, that was my first job in the in, in, in California, and I have to work the well, the service bar, and the bar, and I have four blenders. So frozen margaritas, I hate them forever because I was so busy. I did we didn't have a machine, so we have to make it at the at, at the moment. People love it. I think a frozen margarita respect uh, deserve a good respect mm -hmm. because there's always a time and a moment where you can have a nice frozen. Classic lime or a fruit flavor margarita by the beach, by the pool. They're mm. beautiful. You know, we at the restaurant, we were known for our margaritas in general. And, you know, nothing like the pour like this, like that. We, we, we had measuring cups on the bar, and they had to, they had to make the margaritas according to, to my recipe. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And it was, it was one part lime juice, one part triple sec, and one and a half parts silver tequila. Mm. It didn't knock your ass off. I mean, it was just, that was so amazing. Because it was, if you, if a margarita, if you measure it exactly, it doesn't feel like liquor. Yeah. yeah. How, how, how was Aaron when he was, when you have that restaurant? Aaron started working with me in uh, at, at Cafe Marimba, my first restaurant. So he was around 10. Because you were about 10, yeah. Because, because I opened in 1987. And he used okay. to do the code check. It used to leave pigs out there, and it was like, uh, but the, all the the coach check people used to hate it that I gave him him one night and Rodrigo the other night because that way they could make their money and that was for the whole week and and I, and I would and I could watch him, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but but he didn't he didn't go when he was younger when he was about eight or nine, he he was in Marimba he was in the kitchen, 
You know, he, was working, he was working at desserts, and he would come out into the floor and say, here is the raspberry sorbet, and over here is the chocolate brownie. And this, like, this, like show with a jacket, you know, because it was all dirty. But he loved it. I mean, he used to even go wash dishes. I mean, yeah. I'd love to tell the story because they asked him, this guy asked him one time, he was an editor-in-chief of the Post or the Village or the Village Voice, either one of those. And he asked him, how much does it pay you? He said, nothing because of the child labor laws. <laughs> and the and the and the, doctor, the the man said, "Well, you know, I'm a I'm a lawyer. I'm very happy to represent you." He said, "No, thank you. I've already hired Jacoby and Myers." <laughs> <laughs> Yo muy trucha. Yo muy trucha. Yeah. Muy, muy picudo. Muy picudo. He, he was adorable. Yeah. Well, you know, right. and and it and it's interesting, Manny, because I think it's something to be said. You know, our my my twin brother Rodrigo. Uh, you know, he worked in restaurants and then became a lawyer. And that's his path yeah. now, you know. And with all the climate that's happened over the pandemic and how the restaurants and bars haven't gotten the proper funding has been has been uh, disappointing and frustrating because the majority of these politicians at some point in their life have worked in a restaurant. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And their yeah, kids yeah. have worked at a restaurant. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, Airlines are getting bailed out and all that. And I don't want to make it political, but I'm just saying. Let's go. Let's, who's having more fun, you or your brother? Well, Rodrigo has a lot of fun. He, yeah, he has he, fun. He's a great cook, by the way. Oh, todo, really? todo mundo en nuestra familia son expertos en la cocina. Right, mom? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know. Él tiene un, un, un lugar en, Insta, en Instagram. Yeah, and and he is starting to get followers because he he's one of those people that loves the history of a dish, so he goes and finds all the exact ingredients. Otherwise, he won't make it. Yeah, you know. So so so. Anyways, it's it's very interesting because it, I, I I said, how should we describe you as a food scholar? He said, no, as a food enthusiast. <laughs> exactly. Very cool. No, pero. It's the, you know, he cooks out of recipe books. He loves all these different cuisines, and and he's really good. And I'm very proud that all of our family are good cooks. I mean, Manny, sadly for you, you're not a good cook, but you know, for us, it's just normal. But uh, get Sarella, you know, I cook sometimes for our own. You know, when we're together, like what, and it's like, like you know, we're traveling, and I cook something. Don't. You know, so what you know, did you I, make? I, Pizza, frozen pizza. <laughs> no, I do cook. Don't lie, you know. No, no, you so, are a good cook. But so you know what? I have a, a question for you. Uh, did you cook with tequila? Yes, I did actually. I have this pollo borracho recipe from forever since I was a young, young even at the ranch because there was a, this couple there that used to make it with sotor, but you know, but we made it, we changed it to tequila, and uh, and it was a. Uh, Chicken with almonds, green olives, and then the sauce with a with a, a slightly thickened with a with a tequila. It was fantastic. Mm. Pollo borracho. It's, it's Pollo. delicious, gorgeous. And we, we had and we had it uh, and we had it. Uh, it the, was on your menu forever. Yeah, and we and the, you always served it with a little pickle serrano or something like that. Very mm. nice. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Aaron? Do you cook with tequila? No, I, I, I'm mostly marinated with tequila, to be honest. Um, I, I remember doing early recipes with like salmon or and like kind of making gravlocks, you know, or smoked salmon with tequila as as, um, as sort of the marinating flavor. But no, I for me, you know, you look at the old traditional um, queso fundido rest, uh, recipes, you know, they were flambéed, right? Fundido flambéed. And a yeah. lot of those old school restaurants in Mexico City would take tequila and flambe the cheese, right, Manny? Do you remember those? Or it, it was, I, I mean, my experiences were always with tequila uh, when you when you kind of cook that, so. Yeah. I'm trying to think of unusual things. You know what, one of the drinks that you don't imagine is going to be good, but it's really good, is the Petrolero, you know? Yeah. Talk to us about the Paloma. Manny, because the Paloma probably is the second most popular outside of the Margarita, no? Yeah, I the Paloma, in, you know, in Mexico, people don't drink Margaritas. No, people, no they, the, don't. The, they the, don't. The, the people, they go and visit our country on the beach resorts, they do, 
Well, Mexican people, we don't drink margaritas. We drink derecho mm -hmm. or we drink paloma mm -hmm. or we drink charro negro. So mm -hmm. what, is, what, what, what is the paloma? Uh, uh, Pal paloma, beautiful cocktail. The origins of the paloma is from Jalisco. Tequila blanco, uh, ice, pinch of salt, a squeeze of lime, top with a squirt or any oh, yeah. other grateful soda. Yeah. yeah. And that is very important that people, is, you know, I travel, I travel the world and it's like, I go to a bar, it's like, can I have a Paloma? Because it's the, to me, it's the most tasty cocktail and easy to make. And it's beautiful. And mm. I go to bars and it's like, can you make me a Paloma? And they make me, they try to impress me and they put a bitter and I, they put a Campari or they put some, and it's a cocktail. It's not a Paloma. I say, beautiful drink, brother. Thank you very much. But this is not a paloma. Paloma, no. you stick. It's so easy. Three ingredients, not counting the ice. You, you know what I love the vampiro. Vampiro, beautiful mm -hmm. vampiro. Yeah, is you, a take the, you take the sangrita, which is a chaser that the, the, you often no. serve with the gila. All right, let's yeah. talk about what, what what I mean for everybody. We have to explain everything, okay? So what's in a vampiro? What's in a and and the and the in the in the chaser and the sangrita, please for everybody. Okay, you, you so the sangrita. Sangrita, sangrita. When you go to Mexico, you order a tequila, and they always serve you a tequila derecho. That means straight, and they're gonna. They don't ask. They give you a sangrita, and it's a little chaser. It's based with the base is tomato, tomato juice some citrus juices, some type of sweet and spices. Everybody has a different recipe of sangrita. There's beautiful, it's nice, tangy, citrusy, it's spicy. And people ask me all the time, which one is first, the tequila or the sangrita? And it's like, I think you decide which one is the best, but it's like a beautiful combination. That's very Mexico, very, you know, when you go anywhere, I mean, I don't, we've been in Mexico multiple times. Mm -hmm. We order a tequila and sangrita. You don't need us. Sangrita is right there and we love it. Yeah. So, so, so the vampiro you make by mixing sangrita with, with uh, tequila, la, uh, tequila, lime, sangrita, and top with grapefruit soda. Wow. No, so no, 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 no. El vampiro no lleva, no lleva grapefruit soda. Sorry. Yeah. No. ¿Qué lleva? No, no más lleva eso. No, no lleva man, grapefruit man. soda. Otherwise, other, otherwise es a, otherwise es a, es a Bloody Maria, a spicy Bloody Maria. No, no, I, ha, I, I have, I have the book that I finally got, de Marichu en la cocina de México. Ahí tiene la receta, pero es en de... Es no se la sabe. Yo, <laughs> yo soy mixólogo toda la vida, doña. Yo me las he hecho, todo, pero, todo. Pero, pero ¿Eh? yo tengo muchos más años que tú y yo he tomado muchos más vampiros que tú y yo nunca... El, los he el, vampiro, con... el vampiro es is, is, is diluted with grapefruit soda. Sí. Like that, yeah. Otherwise, well, uh, otherwise well, it's well, too we'll thick. See. No, mami, no, pero no. Hay, hay que debatarlo, mami. You know, no, we can no. have a debate about it, pero está bien, ten, mami. Sarela, ten dollars, ok? Next show. Ok, ten, ten dollars. Ok, ándale. Ahí lo vemos, mami. Ok. Ya sabes. No, pues así es, ¿no? Um, uh, Another cool cocktail with tequila. What oh, no, you, what let, let's on? talk about the bandera, right? So the bandera, bandera is an interesting one because we're on the topic of sangrita and tequila. So let's explain a little bit of what the bandera is, right? So it's like, so, go ahead. Mexicans, we love to be Mexicans. We're very, very proud to be Mexicans. So we have a cocktail that serves in three different shots or caballos represents the Mexican flag, mm -hmm. right? Or Mexi the colors of the Mexican flag. So we have mm -hmm. the blanco, the uh, uh, el verde, y el rojo. Mm -hmm. ¿Y el verde qué es? El verde es el limón. Limón. Que es ah. Limón, and sangrita, and, and, and the tequila blanco. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and that's like the beautiful bandera. And you'll get it there presented to you. And, and you just see And you can kind of play with one. it, yeah, in the different styles, so... Yeah, I wanted to tell you one. But before we go, mm -hmm. the uh, the the name of the plant that the, the sotol is, uh, is probably related to the asparagus, because this is asparagus. Yeah, yeah. Asparagus. But is that the is that the primary ingredient or no? Yeah, it's it's, it's it's a type of. It has no agave though. I don't believe that. 
I think the blue agave is part of the asparagus family too. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So Just Google it's, it's, it. It's, it's it's very, that's that's why I thought it was very interesting. Look, this is what's exciting about this. We're having a very healthy debate amongst three proud Mexicans, and you know how that goes, okay? But from, from different races of the country. Exactly. And look, th we have some different opinions on things, and that's a healthy conversation that we're having right now. If somebody uh, might opinion different from what Manny says versus my mom or myself, please, we open it up, send some comments. And all we want to do is be authentic and be and be true to what uh, to what we're talking about in the subject matter. So please, um, you know, and, and, and that's what we're trying to get accomplished here. The world of tequila is something that is so important um, to the identity of Mexican culture. And I think I, I, I'm so happy that I, I, we, we had you here, Manny, because you're somebody that's somebody so important to me. Aparte, no eres mi hermano, eres mi compa. Es mi compadre. And anybody that's Mexican that's listening to this knows the difference between an amigo versus a compadre. Cuando eres mi compadre, it's very different, you know? Yeah, and and you you're my compadre. And, and, and I'm really uh, happy that you came here. Mom, he was great, right, Mom? He's yeah, very knowledgeable, right. you know? We had a little bit of, uh, of some tension versus the vampiro and sotol, but the we vampiro. can get past it. We can get past that. We'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to tell you, Sirella, I want to see those $10 ship it on the mail of Bebmo or Zell or whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to show you. The, the soon as we finish the show, start sending in my 10 bucks because yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> very top so. of the money, okay? No, 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 because I'm gonna, I have all these Mexican cookbooks with, with drinks on them. And, okay. But, yeah, but you, don't, nice. you don't have my... <laughs> uh, now you have the cookbooks but you don't have the mixology books that I have yeah okay. so let's let's have a let's have a healthy debate and I think what would be fun is to do an Instagram live of all three of us to settle this and I think that would be really fun okay <laughs> it doesn't have to be a I whole can do, I can do I can do the shaking <laughs> and the, let's do it let's do it <laughs> <laughs> Mom, if there's one thing that Parkinson is good for, is the shaking. <laughs> Brilliant, okay. Mom. Yeah. I don't. Do you want? Do you want to talk about this? Yes. All right. So let's before we go, let's talk about the most beautiful um, tequila that I know. It's called Tequila Casadores Blanco. I'm very happy to be partnered with them uh, again. Uh, we have a relationship for over five years. This year, we're going to be doing some beautiful things together for Tequila Casadores, 100% Blue Agave from Los Altos. They're coming up on their 100-year anniversary, right, Manny? Which is going to be years, beautiful. 100, yep. 100 years next year, and uh, we're ready. We're preparing for the celebration. Yeah. You will be part of that, Aaron. And, Absolutely. Uh, and we'll be traveling to Mexico to celebrate there and all over the world, you know, yeah. to... Uh, yeah. We're part of the history of tequila, mm -hmm. and uh, we're very proud for that. Yeah, absolutely. So, oh, this. And Manny doesn't know my toast. Okay, dale. We came upon a, a, a graduation ceremony in a little village in Monte Patepetu, and they invited us to a celebration that followed. And we, one of the parents stood up and said, Hago este ofrecimiento porque solo no se puede compartir la vida. Otros tienen que estar ahí. So he said, I, I make this offering because alone one cannot share life. Others must be there. So thank you for being here with us. It was a pleasure to get to know you a little bit more. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invite. Sarella, it's always a pleasure always talking to you. Good to see you. You stay beautiful the way you are. Aaron, I cannot say the same thing to you, uh, but I yeah. love you, brother. Yeah. Hey, hablamos todos los días. Entonces, ahí estamos. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Abrazos. Cooking in Mexican from A to Z is powered by Simple Cast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritageradionetwork. 
Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, and more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without your support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like. Tell your friends and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Yeah.